Glad to see you this morning. So a couple weeks ago, we put on our Facebook account uh, kind of a, a poll of what you wanted me to teach on. We're doing a series called Answers, and so you listed the, the things that, we wanted to, that you wanted me to speak on. And so t- this morning, I'm going to start with that list, and uh, you chose one of the hardest things in the book to talk about. Thank you very much for that. So we're going to talk this morning about why God allows evil and suffering in the world today when He has the power to stop it. Why doesn't He? That's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, I'm telling you, your friends and neighbors and maybe even you are asking that question in their heart. They want to know good, solid reasons. And many many people are using that as a means to flee the faith as opposed to embrace their faith. So this is a really important thing for you to learn and understand. So if I were you, I'd take some notes this morning, maybe take some snapshots of the screen as we talk about some of the verses we're going to deal with because this is, this is a hot topic, and especially if you're young and on college campuses, this is an issue that uh, is right in your face. And so you're going to want to have some answers in regards to this subject matter. So let me pray. And then I'm going to just jump right into it. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you for just the opportunity we have to to deal with tough questions. And I pray that you would give me the right spirit to answer these questions, God. And I pray that you would give me a heart of humility and a spirit of grace. And Lord, allow me to have clarity in my thinking as I speak your word today. In Jesus' holy and powerful and awesome name, amen. So when you think of the man-made evils in the world, it's kind of depressing and overwhelming, if you understand what I mean. All you have to do is read uh, online the news or watch TV or where, whatever source of your news is, and you'll discover that it's a pretty depressing world that you and I live in. Every day there's something new. I mean, there's, it's thing after thing after thing. It's just relentless in how it's coming and how fast it's coming today. And uh, anything from sex scandals to man-made famines to wars to fanatical terrorism to racism to ethnical cleansing, not to mention uh, religious atrocities like the Crusades of past. Uh, Then there are things like plagues and earthquakes and tsunamis and floods, and it it goes on and on and on. And and so there is a, a philosopher by the name of Ronald Nash, and this is what he says. He says this, Every philosopher believes that the most serious challenge to theism, that is our belief in God, was and is and will continue to be the problem of evil in the world. How can a loving God allow such atrocities like you and I are seeing? Why is it when you look at, when you look on the news, when you're seeing these visible images, why would a loving, powerful God ever permit what's going on in our world today? If he is loving and he's all-powerful, he's, he's loving and he has the power to stop it, why doesn't he? That's the question that we're going to look at today. And I pray that you'll put your thinking cap on with me today because we're going to go a little bit deeper than we normally go. Uh, but I hope that you'll get it and I'm going to make it as clear as I possibly can. But this, is, this is something we just need to know. So after every tragedy, here's the question that everyone is asking. Where was God? Where was God? And there's plenty of tragedies to go along uh, around. So the question is always the same. It's where is God? And it's always been since the, it's since the design of humankind. It's always been that question. And uh, in years past, a guy by the name of C.S. Lewis addressed this issue for his culture and his time. If you're not familiar with C.S. Lewis, he is really worth the read. And he has, he has a, a book called The Lion, the Witch, uh, and the wardrobe, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. It's a book and it's a movie. And I'm just going to stop and I'm going to say uh, for every parent here in the audience, you ought to get that film and watch it with your children. And kids, if you're in the audience, listen to me. Turn to your mommy and say, I want to watch that, mommy. <laughs> you're th- you're, you know, thank you. You're welcome. I'm you know, just want, trying to help here. I'm just saying this is C.S. Lewis deals with this horrific issue in his culture, in his time, and he does it by an analogy, does it by a story, and it's really powerful. And he takes this complex world called, called Narnia, and he develops characters in Narnia, and uh, it is amazing. And you see layers in this story of uh, casualty and sin and, and deliverance. It is a very, very powerful question. And in the land of Narnia, there is always winter but never Christmas. 
So why is that in C.S. Lewis's story? The answer is, is because the white witch enslaves the land. Just like today in our world, there's someone who enslaves the land. And uh, why does Aslan have to die? The answer is because Edmund was a traitor, just like you and me. So it's very powerful imagery. I, prob I promise you, every child that I've ever watched watch that movie is glued to the screen. It's fascinating, it's powerful, it's awesome, it's a great story, and it has great truth behind it. So parents, look me in the eye. Look me in the eye, parents, listen to me. Do your children a favor and start dealing with this issue early because you don't want your children to walk away from the faith because they can't answer the question, where is God in the midst of tragedy? Where is God in the midst of my suffering? So let's start with this premise. That was all free. Uh, let me start with this premise. Are we having fun so far? Yeah. Awesome. So let me start with this premise. Rejecting God does not solve the problem. Oftentimes, people use it as a cloak to hide from the faith or leave the faith because they're saying if, there's, if God is all-powerful, then he should do something about it. But I'm just going to simply say rejecting God does not solve the problem. Evil and suffering still exists. You can't just pull the, the covers over your head and say, you know, I'm just going to pretend it all doesn't exist. We have to have real answers. And we have to deal with it in a way that is real and authentic and powerful and truthful. So here is the question I would ask all my atheist friends. If we are evolving, if you and I are evolving because atheists hide behind the fact that the Bible presents a God that is either unpowerful, not powerful, or is unloving. So here's the question that I would ask back to all my atheist friends, and I have several. Um, if we are evolving, how come we are not evolving in moral character? Have you ever thought about that? Things aren't getting better and better and better and better in the world today. There's more terrorism today than there's ever been. There's more war. There's more famine. There's more man-made famine. There is more political corruption. There's more sex scandals. There's, you know, you just go on and on and on. And I'm just telling you, we're not getting better. Do you see that? As a human race, we are not evolving into something that is superior to what was 100 years ago or 200 years ago or even 1,000 years ago. It's the same and actually maybe even getting worse. Some people try to deal with the problem of, of uh, senseless suffering by abandoning their belief in God. But I'm telling you, it, it doesn't work. But, the, but um, that leaves a big question. If there is no God, why then should you be outraged when bad things happen if there's no God? What I find funny, and I don't mean to be belittling, and I, I, I'm just going to speak the truth, what I find funny about our culture is that when bad things happen, atheists all of a sudden have a faith in God. And they're saying, see what God did? I thought you didn't believe in him. See what I'm saying? I mean, it's just kind of a funny thing. So uh, I just hope that you'll have an answer after today. Uh, and uh, when you begin to see what's going on in our world and you see what the Bible says, I think, I think you'll have some answers. So violence, cruelty, injustice, justice, injustice happen all the time. On what basis can we say that something is unjust? Why can I say that murder is unjust? On what basis? Am, can I say, can I look you in the eyes and say, you lied, you're wrong? On what basis can I do that? Two famous thinkers gave very two different answers, and I think they're fascinating. Dr. Martin Luther King gave one answer, and he said this. He said that there are no, if there is no higher divine law, if there isn't a God and he doesn't give his word out to us, then we have no way to know what is just and what is not just. He's a, here's a man who gave his life to writing injustice in his life, right? You all get that? Here's a Christ follower that steps into the battle and fights against injustice in the culture that you and I live. So he says the only reason he did it was because there's a higher law. There's a God who now communicates to me how I'm supposed to live, and he shows me what is right and what is wrong. On the contrary, on the opposite side of that, there was an atheist, a German philosopher by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche, and uh, he at one point heard of this volcanic eruption that destroyed an entire island. Thousands of people died. And you know what his response to that tragedy was? He said, wonderful. 
He said, wonderful. And before you judge him, I just want you to know that he was right in saying it in his theology. What he's saying is no one has the right to determine what is right and wrong. If there is no God, he's, op he's operating maybe even more consistent than we are. He's just being consistent with his theology. He believes there's no God, so there's no basis of human justice. Do you, you understand that? So I'm saying both of these guys had one thing in common, and uh, they had different views, but they had one thing in common, and that is simply this. If there is no God, that in, then injustice is perfectly normal, natural, if there's no God. So abandoning belief in God doesn't help with the problem of suffering at all. So I want to spend the rest of our time together saying, okay, how can I make sense of it then? If there is a God, I'm going to assume that you're here today because you believe that there is a God and you probably want some answers in your own life to be able to give to your friends who are saying things like that or, or respond to, to at work when people say, hey, what about God? Why doesn't he stop this stuff? So let me give you three things that you can take home today, three things that I believe are absolutely true that come right from the pages of Scripture that gives you the ammunition and the, and the understanding of why God would allow evil in our world today. Because I'm just going to say right up front, God is absolutely sovereign, all-powerful, King of kings. There is no one more powerful than he is, and he is not being held hostage by Satan. God is doing exactly what he's choosing to do. So let's start with principle number one. Are you ready for this? You're not going to like the first one, but that's okay. Here we go. So here we go. Principle number one is God uses evil and suffering for his own glory. God uses evil and suffering for his own glory. God reveals himself as the good creator of all things, who has infinite power and wisdom, who upholds and directs and governs all creatures and things. He does this by his own counsel. He doesn't ever, he never ever asked me for my opinion. He does this all because of his own counsel. So listen to this, Psalm 103, verse 19. So before I show it to you, it's probably already up there. No, not quite. Don't put it up there yet. So before I show you this verse, let me ask you this question. If I show you a verse, will you believe that the Bible is the authority and the, and the ultimate standard for what I believe? Do you believe that? Okay, so here we go. Psalm 103 verse 19 says, The Lord has made the heavens his throne. From there he rules over what? Everything. God rules over everything, which means that God has a, listen to this carefully, has a purpose for suffering and evil in the world today. We may not like that. We may not understand that, but that's what the Bible teaches, and the Bible always contradicts my thinking. So what this means is, is that God uses all suffering and evil for his own purposes and glory, whether we can see it or not, whether we believe it or not, or whether we like it or not. But here's the promise. This is what God says. This is what he says in his word. The promise is found in Romans 8, 28. Listen to this. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So whatever evil happens in this world, God has a bigger purpose. Whatever evil happens in my life, God has a bigger purpose. I've had some really bad things happen to me. Some evil things happen to me, actually. And I, I, ironically, this is just kind of a sidebar here. As I was preparing this message, I was uh, in my office, 6 o'clock in the morning. I think it was like a Tuesday morning. I was up and ready to study God's Word. And I'm in there, and all of a sudden, I have this stinging like a bullet shoots me in the finger kind of pain. And uh, I'm going, what is that? And I, and I squeezed my finger and I could feel that there was something there. And I, you know, so I flicked it off and there was that spider. And, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking, God, couldn't you, I'm, I'm doing this message for you, God. Are you, couldn't, you couldn't have killed that thing? Come on now, you could have just sent an angel from heaven and that angel could have, you know, swept it out the door. And, you know, you know so I'm doing this message on suffering and all of a sudden, I mean, I, I screamed out in agony. My, my wife runs in and go, she thought I was dying. And, and I, I hoped I would for a while because it was just throbbing. And I'm going, I hope that wasn't a black widow or a brown recluse or something like that. And of course, I'm still alive. So apparently it wasn't. 
So God has a purpose for everything. He has a sense of humor, by the way. I think that was just a glimpse into God's sense of humor as I'm talking about suffering. He's giving me a little experience, to, a little pain to enjoy for the day. So I want to see if we can unpack this for you in a way that you can really grab a hold of who God is and how he works and maybe give you a broader view of who and why God does what he does. So I want you to imagine that you go on this long hike with me. We start early in the morning, we're out for a hike, and uh, five miles into the hike, we run across this bear who is in a trap. You know, one of those traps that, you know, they stick their foot in and, and all of a sudden it closes on them. And here's this angry bear like 30 yards from us. And, and so we have this, we're looking at this bear. And so we have this great empathy. We're going, gosh, good night. This bear is suffering. What are we going to do? We need to do something. So I want to say that, you know, I could walk up to that bear and I could pat the bear on the head and I could say, you know, Mr. Bear, I'm just here to help you. And uh, I, I'm going to grab your foot here and I'm going to pull it out of the trap. But actually, I got to pull it in so I can pull it out and it's going to hurt a little bit more. And so could you just be patient with me, Mr. Bear? And I'm just going to say that if I did that, I would be his lunch, right? Because there's, there's just no reasoning with this angry, hurt bear who doesn't have the ability, I don't have the ability to communicate with him and he doesn't have the ability to communicate with me on the basis of human language. So what if we're like that bear? What if you and I are like that bear? We're wounded and we're entrapped in sin and God has a rescue for us. He has a rescue for us, but we don't understand what he's trying to do. So we conclude that God must be, listen to this carefully, hostile towards us. Isn't that what a lot of unbelievers conclude? That even though everything in the Bible suggests that God is a God of redemption and rescue and love and power, His rescue, His rescue sometimes is misinterpreted as a hostile act. And sometimes, listen carefully, God has to use suffering in our lives to get us to that place where we see our need for Him. And without suffering, maybe we'd never come to that conclusion that there's something besides myself that's in control. So I'm just saying that God, the sovereign God of the universe, is, is at work in this planet, on this planet. He has a system that he's working in that includes good and evil, and he is a sovereign God, and he's using everything he's using for my good and for his glory. That's the truth. But here's the question that you have to ask. Would you rather have chance directing your life or would you rather have God directing your life? You can, you can choose chance. You can say, I'm going to abandon God. Or you can say, even though I can't see what he's doing, even though as that hurt bear, I don't understand it, I'm going to submit to God because in the end, I know that God is extremely good. He is good. Lee Strobel points out in, a classic, in his classic book, The Case for Christ, and, uh, and in the movie itself, he actually tweets this. So I'm going to show, show you a tweet that he does this, this year. He says, if God can take the worst thing that could ever happen, the death of his son, and turn it into the best thing that could ever happen, the opening of heaven for all who follow him, then he can take your difficulties and draw good from them for you. Do you believe that? So when I begin to, when I begin, and here's what I, I'm saying all this to say, sometimes Christians start apologizing for what God is doing without, without even knowing what he's doing. God has a bigger plan than you can understand. We don't need to apologize for God. The plan that God has includes both good and evil, and he's using all those things together for his own purposes and his own glory. And this is why I can trust him is because he declares and is proven by his, his track record that he is holy. That is, that he is separate from us and that he is not, that he is loving and that he has my best interest at heart. So when evil happens, I can learn to trust him. That's the first principle. 
The second principle is a little easier. I started with the, the hard one first. The second principle is a little easier. So here's the second principle. Second principle from God's Word is God gives choice. God placed Adam and Eve in a perfect environment called the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 1. He tells them that they have a choice. He doesn't use that word, but he says, listen, you can do whatever you want to do. You can have any fruit you want to have. You can do whatever you want to do. But here's the thing is that I, I don't want you, I don't want you to eat from that one fruit from the tree in the midst of the garden. That's the one thing you can't do. Don't do it. And he spells out the consequences if, he do, if they do do it. And so we know the story, right? Adam and Eve can resist anything but temptation. And so the deceiver comes along and said, hey, God's withholding something from you. God isn't really that good. Just follow my ways. My ways are good. And uh, he doesn't say that, but that's the implication. And so they are beguiled into or deceived into partaking of that fruit. And then you and I know the outcome of that. And they chose wrong and the consequences are laid out in advance. And you and I are here today in the midst of the suffering of this planet because of a choice that Adam and Eve made. And I mean, I, one of these days when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a little chat with Adam and Eve <laughs> because here's the thing, I could be today being so joyous naked in the middle of the garden <laughs> and no one wouldn't even know I was naked. And I wouldn't be having, no one would be saying, hey, you're putting on a few pounds there, Pastor Dan. No one would be saying that. There would be no sin. I mean, there would just be a perfect, envi perfect environment. But here's the reality. Listen to this carefully. I actually am glad that Adam sinned. You know why? Because I and you, if you have a faith in Christ, have a superior position to Adam. Did you know that? Why is my position superior to Adam? Because I, listen to this carefully, because of what Christ did for me on the cross, I am not one mistake away from losing everything. I can't lose it. God has secured it for me. So this is a pretty amazing story. But let me get back to the, the heart of what I, I, I want to say. So God puts Adam and Eve in the midst of this garden and says, listen, don't do that. They did it. And why, so why would God allow that? Why would God say, he knew what they were going to do, right? Why would God say, don't do it, when he knew by saying it, don't do it, they would do it? Here's what I think. This is my opinion. I believe that God, it's, it's an informed opinion, by the way. I believe that God wants me to love him with all my heart, mind, and soul. I believe that my responsibility to God is not to blindly obey him, but loyally obey love him. You with me? That's what all through, the, all through the Bible, that's what it says. I'm to love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, and soul, I'm to love my neighbors myself. And so here's the deal. For love to exist, there has to be choice. There is no love without choice. There has to be a choice. I have to be able to not choose God. There has to be a choice. For the choice to exist, it has to be legit, Right? For the, for the choice to exist, there ha it has to be legit. So it has to be full-blown evil and full-blown good. They have to be allowed to live side by side. So God has created a system where I have the opportunity to choose. And, and here's the reality. Love doesn't exist without choice. 43 years ago, 43 and three quarters of a year ago, I proposed to my wife. We actually, I didn't propose to her then. We actually got married. And uh, here's how it worked. I'm just going to say how it worked. I I'm just going to be honest. I looked at all, and back then when I was a young dude, I looked at all the other women around and I said, that's the one. That's the one I want to marry because love is a choice. And I'm still making that daily choice. It wasn't a choice I made 43 years ago and said, I hope it works out for the better. I make that choice every day. Love is a choice. And so for that choice to exist, there has to, be, there has to be a legit choice. So God created these two systems, and he says, listen, listen to me, you can choose. That's true love. That's how God has loved us. Now, my question to you is this. Would you rather have choice or live programmed to respond? Would you rather have choice 
or live programmed to respond. In other words, it's already put in your head and your heart what you're going to do. You just get up every morning. You just go through the same things every day, and you make the same decisions. I mean, you're just programmed to respond out of rote. Would you rather have that, or would you rather have the ability to choose? God has created an environment where we can see choice. But here's the deal. Listen to this very carefully. For evil to exist, God has to let it exist. And when it exists, unjust things happen to good people. That's what happens. Unjust things happen to good people. But there's two pieces of good news that you don't want to miss. The first one is a promise. It's found in Psalm 34, verse 18, and this is what it says. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. The God, God says here, here's the promise, is that when unjust things happen to me, I have a place to run, and He's near to me. He draws near to my injustices in my life. May not feel that way, may not seem that way sometimes, but the truth is, is that God draws near to you when you're broken, when you're hurting. God draws near to you. That's a promise that you can take to the bank. It's a very powerful promise. So every parent here, how many parents do we have in the room today? Raise your hand. Amen. I'll pray for you today. <laughs> every parent has the same goal for their, from the time their children enter the world. This is what it is, to keep them sheltered from harm. Isn't that right? Come on now. Parents, look at, at me. We all have the same goal. We do not want our children to suffer. And that is how almost every one of us are wired. We don't want our children to suffer. But that is not the best we can do. That is not the best we can do. Here's the best we can do. The best we can do is to be present with them in suffering because they're going to suffer. To be with them in suffering and point them to the God who is with them also in suffering. That's the best thing that you can do as a parent is to be with your children in suffering and then point them to the God who is with them as well. There's a second piece of good news here, and that is that God has designed this injustice to cause great growth in our life. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3, it says this, and not only that, but we also are very happy in tribulations. We glory in tribulations. Why? Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance produces proven character. Proven character is what we're after. We want, we want our lives to change. So anybody here want life change? It happens through oftentimes suffering, and that suffering oftentimes is at the hand of unjust people. So again, what do you want? Do you want to grow or do you want to stay the way you are? God allows evil in our world to allow us not only to experience his presence, but to experience his power in growth. And I can tell you, I have grown more through suffering than I have through studying of the Bible. I mean it. I, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I have a master of divinity from a, West, from a seminary. You know, it cost me thousands and thousands of dollars. But I have an even greater degree from the halls of suffering. That's where I've learned to know who God is in His genuine way. So God allows suffering so that I can grow in character. It's His will. There's a third principle here, and this gets great. This is the great news for us, is the third principle is the best is yet to come. This is not the best of all possible worlds that you and I live in. This is Reno, okay? This is not the best of all pro possible worlds. There's, good night, there's smoke out there, right? There's fires near us. There's sin abounding everywhere. This isn't the best place to live. Tennessee Williams said, don't look forward to the day you stop suffering because when it comes, you know you're dead. That is certainly one way to look at it, but there is another way, and that way is to look at it through the eyes of the book of Revelation. And here's what the book of Revelation just says. Chapter 21, verse 5 says, He who is seated on the throne said, I'm making everything new. There is a world that's coming that where God makes everything, I mean everything new. So let me teach you the book of Revelation in 30 seconds. Here's what it is. Here we go. Put your seatbelt on. This is the book of Revelation in Pastor Dan's abridged notes. Here we go. 
The book of Revelation is simply this. There is a scroll that is undone in the book of Revelation. They are sealed by seven seals. And every time a seal is taken off, we're one step closer to when Jesus takes possession of the earth once again. And we see it unfold all through the book of Revelation. It's seven seals unfolded. And at the end, we come to Revelation where God says, he who sits on the, this is what God, this is God says in the book of Revelation, he who sits on the throne is making all things new. There's coming a time when God is going to take what's in this world and he's going to right the wrongs. That's what we hope for. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're passive about evil and injustice. I'm not saying that. We should fight it everywhere we can. But what I am saying is we never flee our faith because of unjust, uh, we live in an unjust world. We run to God, not from him. And so often what happens when people get into a little bit of trouble, they run away from God. Are you stinking kidding me? You're running away from the one who loves you. You're like that bear. God is trying to rescue you, and you, are, you just don't get what he's trying to accomplish. This is so important. And you know what I love about heaven? Heaven is the place of no mores. Listen to this. This is so good. There's no more evil. Can you imagine a place that I can walk out? I don't have to lock my door. I can walk down the street. I don't have to fear evil in any way. Heaven is a place of no evil at all. It is a place <clears throat> of no more death. There's no death. There's no loss. There's no loss. And God is going to take all the loss that I've had here and he is going to wipe away my tears and he's going, to, he's going to give me something brand new. And the scripture says that eye hasn't seen or ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him. God is preparing a place. He is preparing a place. And he's going to come back for his people. And when he comes back, there will be no more death. Death is swallowed up in victory. At that trumpet, death is swallowed up in victory. And I live with absolute assurance from that day forward. I live in a better position than being naked in a garden. I live in a place where I can't blow it and find my way to the exit doors and getting kicked out with a boot by God. That's not going to happen in heaven because the death of Jesus Christ secures me for all eternity forever and ever. There is no more death and there is no more mourning. There's never a time when you're going to mourn about anything. You're not going to grieve over anything. There's not going to be any grief recovery classes in heaven. It's all good. Nothing bad, all good. And heaven is a place of no more pain I don't know if some of you have chronic pain. I, I, I don't even, can't even imagine what that feels like, chronic pain. Heaven is a place where there's no chronic pain. And here's the best news of all. You'll never, ever, ever shed a tear. There's no more tears there. It's not a place that we need to cry about anything because we'll be in the presence of the Lamb. Face to face, face to face, the rest of our life in a place that is secure and powerful, and this is a loving God. And so God has scripted from Genesis to Revelation this plan that includes suffering because he's involved in a rescue. And it includes choice because he wants us to love him. And it involves hope because he tells us the outcome. We've read the end of the book. So we have hope that it's going to change. My best days are yet to come. My best days are amazing. Can't even begin to imagine. Can't even begin to imagine what that's going to be like. Yeah, you can applaud. That's amazing. That's an amazing truth that God is going to rescue me and all he wants me to do is follow him, follow his ways, and live for him. Love him with all my heart. It's a place of perfect communion with God, with each other, there's not going to be any sexual harassment in heaven. There's not going to be any gender differences, any race differences. It's a place of beauty, of communion. And it's a place that Jesus captured for us all. What a marvelous joy awaits everyone who believes in Jesus.
So God is sovereign, God is loving, and God is good. In spite of how it looks right now in your life, I'm telling you, God is good. He's good all the time. He can't be bad. So when it looks like he's bad, it's a deception, smoke and mirrors. God is always good. He's always good. He's never inconsistent. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is always good? You know, there's times that I've faltered with that. I thought, I, I've cried out and said, God, do you know what's going on? Can you see? Have you ever been there? And I've had to come back to this conclusion. Listen to it carefully. I have nothing to lose but believe it, that God is good. If I'm wrong and I'm, and I'm in the grave and there is no God, it's over. I won't, I won't be around to suffer the consequences. But if you flee from God and I'm right, there is huge consequences to that. So will you make a choice today to get up every day in your life and you proclaim that God, in spite of how I feel, in spite of what's going on in my body, my head, my friends, my boss, my family, in spite of all those things, I'm going to choose to proclaim that God is a God of goodness. That's who he is. He's, he's a good God. And let's not be like that bear that somehow shrinks back and goes, surely this God must have some evil in mind. No. He's a rescuer. He's proven his love for us in that while we were continually sinning, Christ died for us. And I'm telling you, listen, you walk right into the hands of the deceiver when you disbelieve God's goodness. He is so important for you as a child of God to every day proclaim that God is good. He is good. Would you do that right now with me, just out loud? Say it with me. God is good. Now let's try it this time with feeling. God is good. Now let's stand and let's sing about it.